uh, some years ago, I was giving a talk somewhere and somebody asked me, please explain how collective kamma works. And I had heard this term before, but um, I knew it had nothing to do with Buddhism. I thought it might be some new age idea or maybe from Hinduism or something. And I said, well, uh, what do you mean by collective kamma? And the person explained it like this, that say um, a large, you might have a large group of people who are connected in some way. For example, they're all the citizens of a particular country or they're all a particular ethnic group. And if a given number of people in that group do something negative, the comic effect of that will not be individual, it will affect the whole group. That's as it was explained to me. And uh, so I said, well, if that's what you mean by collective kamma, that has nothing to do with Buddhism. Buddhism is talking about uh, and teaches individual responsibility, not group responsibility. And um, as a consequence of that, I started to do some research on this idea of collective kamma. And when I looked uh, about it, I discovered, in fact, many Buddhist teachers, uh, apparently mainly in the West, are teaching something they call group kamma or corporate kamma or collective kamma, as if it were a part of traditional Buddhism. And I must say that I was really shocked. So I, um, I know the Pali Tupitika well enough to know that there is nothing remotely like this in the teachings of the Buddha. So uh, I started doing some research in um, Sanskrit and early uh, Mahayana literature and what have you. I had a friend who was very learned in Chinese Buddhist literature. We had long discussions about this, and the consequence was there is nothing like this in traditional Buddhism either. Okay, so the idea of collective kamma may be true, it may be false, but it it has nothing to do with Buddhism. And if you think about it, I mean logically, how is this possible? How can it happen? And if it does happen, well, it's it's a great disaster. This means that, um, um, let's say we have an ethnic group, a particular group, and because some people in that group do something negative, the, the comic consequence somehow spreads from the individuals who did it to the whole group. Well, if that is the case, we're in very serious trouble, because if you take where I come from, if 12% of Australians do something negative, that means something negative is going to happen to me. On the other hand, uh, if 12% of Australians do something positive, well, I, I get a windfall. I did. This undermines the whole idea of morality and um, individual responsibility. Nothing like this was ever taught by the, uh, by the Buddha. Now, since that time, I've tried to find where did this idea come from? So it is not in any traditional Buddhist literature that I have been able to examine. And the earliest example of it I come, uh, I've come across is in The Secret Doctrines, which is a book written by the famous um, theosophist, the founder of theosophy, Madame B.P. Blavatsky. Now, um, I can't say that I'm a great fan of <laughs> Mrs. Blavatsky, but in her book, The Secret Doctrines, uh, Secret Doctrines, she talks about what she calls national kamma. Huh? The idea that a whole nation can be, uh, uh, become victim of the negative kamma created by a certain number of people in that uh, in that group. Then I came across in some later writings the idea of what they call, um, I can't remember what he called it now, but uh, something similar to that. If you have, for example, a um, military, uh, an army platoon, 50 soldiers in a platoon, and the leader, 
he's a stronger individual than the than the general soldiers, if he does something negative, he, our overflow kamma, this is what it was called, the negative kamma will overflow from him into all of the others. Or if you've got, I don't know, a Boy Scouts group, and the Boy Scout leader who is um, um, psychologically um, more potent or bigger or something like that, he does something very positive, and the positive comer from him will overflow into the rest of the group. And since that time, I found quite a lot of other um, versions of this collective comma. But in all its forms, I think it is very important to point out that this is not a Buddhist uh, idea. It's not to be found in the teachings of the Buddha, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, it's not to be found in any traditional Buddhist literature until the 19th century, where it seems fairly early to have spread from Madame Blavatsky to some Western Buddhist theosophists. And then I found in about 1890, there is an article on uh, collective kamma in a, a number of the Mahabodhi Journal, which was a very early international Buddhist magazine. And it may, uh, I speculate, it may have spread from that into the general Buddhist community and become quite widespread and, and influential in the last 30 or 40 years. So the other question that's just been asked is about the in-between state. Uh, this is called the Antarabhava. So uh, this is a theoretical question, but it's an important one. And uh, this is the situation. According to different schools of Buddhism, some say that when a person dies, they are reborn instantaneously. Hmm? That is, for example, the Theravadan view. There are other schools of Buddhism that say that when a person dies, they hover in an in-between state for a given period, and then they're reborn. Okay? Um, and then there are different versions of how long that in-between state may be. I think some say six days, some say 40 days, some say until certain things happen, okay? So we have these two views. Some say there is an antarabhava, some say there isn't, okay? So what is the, what's, what's the truth of this situation? Well, uh, my personal opinion is if somebody asked me that question, I, I would say, is it really important? <laughs> <coughs> I would say more important than whether you hover in an in-between state before you're reborn or you don't and you're reborn immediately, I would say the most important question is, is what circumstances is a person born into? Favourable circumstances or mixed circumstances or unfavourable circumstances? However, it's a legitimate area of inquiry. So what can we say? Is there an antarabhava or not? Well, the traditional view in Theravada Buddhism is that rebirth takes place immediately. But if you actually read the suttas, there is a, although it's not specifically stated, there seems to be a, um, it, the idea of an antarabhava can be implied from some of the things that the Buddha said. So in one place, in fact in several places, he repeats this idea that um, uh, a person who um, attains enlightenment, they are, uh, they, are, they are no longer accessible. It's neither here nor there or midway in between. This suggests to me that he accepted that there was some sort of in-between state. So my reading of the Tibitaka and my interpretation of the things that I've read is that there is an in-between state. Um, but I emphasize again that I'm not sure 
that this is significant or that it's particularly important. That's my personal view. Uh, those of you who are interested in exploring it more carefully, there are one or two uh, chapters in some books on this subject. Read them and come to your own conclusion.